Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the laws of the Middle Ages, as well as some of the major components that happened in Western Europe during the later part of the Middle Ages. So let's get started. As Rome fell, there was a big concern of a lot of those that were still part of the empire on how to preserve Rome. Now, specifically, we're talking about the Byzantine Empire. There were some great emperors who got the Byzantine Empire moving, grooving, shaking, and doing. However, it really is Justinian who is the standalone guy who's worth mentioning in about the first few centuries. Justinian was responsible for, as we know, the Hagia Sophia Church, the attempts to preserve the empire, to reconquer the old territory. But when it comes to the legal side of things, his biggest contribution is Justinian's code. 534 Common Era, Justinian puts this together, and it really is an attempt to both preserve the law and to adapt the law to a larger um group, specifically the Byzantine Empire itself. Now, Justinian's code itself had three major components. There was the code, which was taking the law and codifying it so that it could be applicable to different characteristics. There was the digest, which was useful for judges who needed to ascertain when and or if a law had been broken and then what the punishment therefore should be. And finally was the institutes. This was basically a collection of what Roman law had been. Justinian was practical enough to understand that his code was going to need to change at some point in the future. It was not going to be the thing everyone was always going to have to follow. At some point or another, laws change. We see that in the United States now pretty frequently. Let's switch to English history and We'll hit England for a bit, and then we'll talk about English legal characteristics. Uh, the big thing when we talk about origins of English history is the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Now, England definitely had a history before this, and they have a great history afterwards. But for a number of modern historians, this is where they talk about modern British history really beginning. And it gets started because of, well, a dispute over who should be in charge, William or Harold. Now, William is from Normandy, that's northern France, and he is a lord in Normandy. He was William the Conqueror, William the Bastard, and he decides that the conquest in France was good, but it was time to expand to also include England. And... This is going to culminate in this tremendous battle that takes place just outside of Hastings at a location that's now referred to as Battle, so some some call this the Battle of Battle, in which case Harold will be defeated. Uh, he had been the Saxon king that had predated um, William, and Harold is going to take a arrow to the eye. Some people say he died immediately. Other people say that he kept on fighting afterwards. Uh, but we do know that he died, and that was the injury that would ultimately kill him. What William does next is pretty impressive, because he was a outsider who tries to conquer, and that's always difficult. What he does to kind of unite his people and subjugate the own conquered individuals is he calls all of England his now property. Everything in it is now his. And he divides up that property, you know, England, into about 200 different smaller fiefs, a fief being a small landed territory that his own Norman lords could control. And they had to swear their own oaths of loyalty to him personally. Now you've got people who can make sure that the local laws are followed, that the authority of the king is merited out, and that if there's anyone not following the law, then you've got, well, a regimented system set in place that's going to make that not happen. This is also considered the beginning of feudalism in England. A very important concept as feudalism in England is going to be the name of the game for quite some time. Following 
William, we see a gap of a couple of kings, but the next major significant thing to talk about is Henry II. Uh, this is our first major attempt to take control of the legal system. Henry II is going to consolidate all the courts in England, and this is really important because if you were in different parts of the country doing different things, in some places it was considered legal, in other places it was considered illegal, this consolidation effort was going to unite all these different court systems into one basic trend. And over time, this is going to develop the idea of common law itself. Um, this is the idea that it is acceptable or not acceptable across the entire realm, in this case country, whether something is legal or not. Now, with the development of common law, we're also going to see the eventual questioning of whether something is punishable or not. And that's going to lead to the eventual development of the grand jury. Now, this is a system where a person or group is going to attempt to figure out if there's enough evidence to go forward. If there's not enough evidence, then there's no reason for a trial. This way you save the people time, you save the state money, you can let the judges focus on what they actually have to do instead of hearing a, uh, stories of hearsay conjecture with not a real amount of power. Near the end of Henry's life, he did attempt to take control of church courts as well as the pragmatic courts, the, the tangible courts, the jurisdictional courts, but this really didn't work to his favor. The power of the king had continued to grow over the course of, well, heck, since William had conquered, and even through Harold trying to control court systems, until about 1215, when King John had by force been, for, by force been forced to, to sign this document, the Magna Carta. Um, it's a Latin word. It, lit, it means the Great Charter or the Grand Charter. And what this did is it made everyone have to follow the law, uh, including the king. This was the first document that in the history of man kind of really put a cap on what the king could do. This was a great opportunity to stop absolutism, and in some regard, it helped quite a bit. I mean, England would still have a civil war where the main theme was absolute monarchies, and there would be uh, the Protestant Reformation's effect in England would definitely be an, ex an excuse of absolutism at its height, but this had the ultimate purpose of saying the king has to follow the law, no one is above the law, and there are limits on all law. Uh, this is just reinforcing common law. Over time, throughout the Middle Ages, the church had been the single dominating thing in Western Europe. It, it united people socially, culturally, it had political, economic power. It really did everything. But over time, the church continued to lose more and more of its authority until we're going to finally see the events that take place with King Philip. Uh, this is going to take place in the 13th century. Specifically, Philip wanted to tax the clergy, and in France, this was a huge no-no. In fact, in fact, most of Western Europe, in fact, all of Western Europe, the ability of a king to tax the clergy or to tax the church offices was considered strictly taboo. And when Philip tried to do this, the Pope at the time said, you know, that's not going to happen. And if this was it, this would have been the end of it, and it would have barely been a footnote in a series of angry letters. But what happens next is really a, an idea of the church losing a lot of its power and application in a religious sentiment. Uh, Philip is going to engineer who is going to become the next pope, and that is going to be Clement V. Once Clement V becomes pope, the first thing he does is he moves the papacy from Rome, from the Vatican, to France. And this is 
the obvious just a sign of I'm taking control and I'm showing you that I can take control and I'm moving the papacy to France. And this really worked very well for Philip because he was able to put a greater hold on this. And during this time, during the years that the papacy was located in France, this town called Avignon, it was referred to as the Avignon Papacy or the Avignon Captivity. Um, and things spiraled out of control. Some of these popes were really ridiculously good for Catholicism. Some of them were amazingly great for the idea of the faith and the faithful. And some of them were corrupt, um, just using their power to help the French king. But ultimately this did not pan out for the long term. Uh, 1378, the Roman cardinals tried to overthrow the Avignonian popes by uh, electing a new one and saying that the, the, the pope in Rome was the legitimate authority and that the pope in Avignon was not. And this continued to go on for just long enough to be really silly. And as this continued to happen, more and more people looked at the role of the church and they had to ask themselves, is this really what the church is when you know we can't agree on who the best person is? It's just a arguing match. Our last major thing we're going to talk about today is the Hundred Years' War. Now, earlier you hopefully remember me mentioning that William the Conqueror, William the I, was from Normandy. That's northern France. He was a lord in there. And then he went to England, and he became king of England. But even though you are a lord, even though you're king of England, that doesn't mean you're no longer a lord in France. So this meant for a couple centuries, the king of England was also a lord of northern France. And by and large, this led to some conflicts here and there and some justifications over land disputes. But in 1337, it really escalates. King Edward of England is going to declare war on King Philip of France. Yeah, that's the same Philip who had um, engineered the Avignonian papacy. And the war lasts until 1453. The war was basically a question over, I am lord of northern Ang France, so I deserve to do that. And the French were equally, no, you really can't because you're not even here. And that's not possible. That's not practical. That's not feasible. A French country for French men. The war lasts until 1453. Now, this is not a math class, but you can clearly see that's more than 100 years. It's a simple matter of what sounds better. The Hundred Years' War. Well, that sounds pretty nice. That's a nice round number to it. The Hundred and Sixteen Years' War. Well, it doesn't sound as good. And remember, this isn't being fought every second for those hundred years. There's seasons where nothing happens at all because, you know, people have to, you know, eat and farm and do all this. But as armies continue to be depleted on both sides, we're going to start to see that the monarchies of both sides are going to turn to their peasants and conscript them, make them foot soldiers. This was really impressive because it used to be knights were it. And now we're starting to see that an average person could become a member of the armed forces, something that had been Im not even conceivable until the time, or since the time of the Roman Empire. One of these most notable individuals was Jean d'Arc, uh, Joan of Arc, as we say here in the West in the United States. Uh, Jean was a young woman. Uh, she was from a city called Orleans, and at the age of 14, she believes that she has been touched by the divine, that she has been um, heralded to lead the forces of French to fight and she goes and fights and she starts gaining more and more notoriety until she is you know really leading forces to to, to do this and rather successfully as well um ultimately though Jean's story ends very badly because she is convicted of witchcraft when she is captured by the British. When the British capture her, uh, they could have executed her for any of a dozen reasons, you know, enemy combatant, enemy soldier, enemy uh, com commander in general. Uh, but she, they executed her because she wore pants. 
um, specifically men's attire and leggings. That may seem silly, but that's what they did. And she was labeled a witch, and a heretical witch, for the next 500 years until uh, church offices finally said, you know, maybe she's just, just a lady who didn't want to die wearing a dress. But that's a question for another day. Ultimately, the Hundred Years' War ends with the French being victorious in 1453. Some people will say that the French were able to successfully beat the English out. Uh, some people say that the English just said, oh, forget it, we've been fighting for a hundred years, we're not going to win, so let's just give up. Um, it really is a definitive end, though. And while this event doesn't mark the end of the Middle Ages, it is one of the most culminating concepts of the Middle Ages and what it'll do to warfare, social constructs, political entities, and even economic trade are all going to be affected by this. So today we took a look at the laws that were created and constructed by the Middle Ages, some of the major uh, events that happened, as well as some of the concepts of warfare that we saw throughout this 500-year period. Hope you learned something, and I'll see you all next time.